Coming up now on Animal Outtakes, when our feathered friends are in need of some help, there is a place that is strictly dedicated to birds. We are visiting the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary. And we're meeting this sleepy tiger. And Onyx deserves a rest. He has had a difficult past. This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtakes. Hello and welcome to Animal Outtakes. I'm Marsha Panucci and this is my best friend Zeus. They evolved from dinosaurs and can be found just about everywhere on Earth. From deserts to mountains, from forests to your backyard, you can find a bird. This week on Animal Outtakes, we visit a sanctuary that specializes in getting our feathered friends back to the wild. The Seaside Seabird Sanctuary is a uh, is a nonprofit 501c3 uh, organization, and our main mission is to rescue, rehabilitate, and uh, what sick, injured, and orphaned wild birds in the hopes of re be able being able to release them back into the wild. It's located in the small community of Indian Shores, a barrier island on the Gulf Coast of Florida. The sanctuary is a special treasure to the town. We kind of function as, as two kind of entities. We have the, the rescue and rehabilitation part with our uh, hospital that's on site, which on average we, uh, we have uh, on average about 3,000 birds per year admitted into the hospital. But on top of that, we're also uh, unique as we're open to the public, almost like a, a zoo or any other attraction. Uh, visitors can come in and actually view all the permanently disabled residents we have living at the facility that uh, cannot be released uh, due to whatever permanent injury they have. Uh, we currently right now have about 112 permanently disabled residents living on site that uh, guests, visitors can view. Um, they range uh, anywhere from the common backyard blue jays um, up to the great horned owls to, to pelicans uh, to hawks, you name it. We have a, a fairly good example here, about 23 different species here. Because of the sanctuary's location, they treat both seabirds and birds you would find inland too. And many that are just dropping by. Looking up in the trees, You'll see even more birds, but these are not being treated by the sanctuary. They're all wild. This is their natural habitat. This is where they nest right here on, on the beach in the trees. But the reason uh, a lot of people just think that there's something about this place, that they come here, they flock here, or, or their residents here, it's simply because we're sandwiched in between all these condos that have built up on the beaches and it's taken away from the natural foliage, the trees, and, and their natural environment that they call home. So they're all here because this is their natural environment and there's really no place suitable right around. There is a shocking abundance of them, showing firsthand how development is one of the factors that has an impact on animals. And when it comes to those birds being treated here, 90% of the injuries are attributed to humans. Keith, we're standing here in the hospital and you know, normally it's kind of a sad place, but these birds are making us happy. So <laughs> you must be rehabilitating them. And so what do we see here in the hospital? Sure, um, in here right now, I mean, we have a full capacity in this, or we, um, the full capacity here in this hospital is, is several hundred birds we could treat inside here. We have uh, uh, cages that we have about uh, 121 cages uh, just inside this hospital alone. Depending on the season, it would be very uh, crowded in here. Right now we're not quite into uh, full uh, to busy season. I have somebody peeking out over here uh, <laughs> and we've got somebody taking their morning nap over here. And this guy over here, isn't he adorable? <laughs> yes, he's gonna show off. He's gonna say, okay, here's my wings. 
What happened to him? Um, this guy, this is a juvenile eastern brown uh, pelican. So he's, he's the pelicans that are, you see all over the place here. He is a younger one and we tell that by his, his coloring. Um, and this guy is in here, for example. Um, he just came in, um, somebody uh, had brought, brought him in, found him on one of the islands off the intercoastal waterway. Um, and he was not very mobile, just uh, just kind of kind of a little not completely lethargic, but just not moving around like he should been. So she was worried about him. She brought him into us. We checked him out. He's uh, he was dehydrated at the beginning when he fr uh, first came in. We gave him fluids, uh, subcutaneous fu fluids to make sure that to get his to get him rehydrated, and we would do that up until at the point making sure he's drinking on his own. Um, and eating on his own and we'll continue to monitor the weight and as long as all that's fine and he's hydrated, his weight is where it should be, he's eating for himself and taking care of himself, then the next stage what we would do is we would take him out to our rehabilitation area um, where uh, he would be in a general public, general population with other pelicans that we're rehabbing and that's just to make sure that he is flying okay and we're confident that he can be re released and, and, and take care of himself. Pelicans have the largest bills of any bird species and it's this big beak that can get them in trouble. Later in the show, what you can do if you notice a pelican or another bird that is hooked with a fishing line. Stay with us, more Animal Outtakes is next. Many active duty servicemen and women face a dilemma as they prepare for deployment. Who will look after their canine companion until they return? Dante's Den provides temporary boarding for their dogs as they serve. We honor the trust placed in us by members of the armed forces by giving their furry friends loving care, spacious dens, on-site veterinary care, and plenty of room to run and play. For more information, go to dantesden.org or call 844-DANTES-DEN. People have asked me what it'll cost to restore all the corals back the way they remember. But I have to ask them, what will it cost if we don't do anything? Welcome back. Octagon Wildlife Sanctuary is home to animals that have been abandoned or neglected. And for a male Bengal tiger named Onyx, Octagon is now his permanent home. A lot of times you'll see him playing with that big tube. I can hardly move that tube over there and the tigers bat it around like it's a balloon. <laughs> it's just incredible to see what they, to, to see how powerful they really are. And I would say the same for that ball over there too. Yes. Well, this is Onyx. The tiger sleeps tonight <laughs> comes to mind. Uh, just like a big, cuddly, stuffed animal that you just don't get too close to. What is Onyx's story? Well, Onyx was brought here as a cub um, the people that owned him wanted to keep him small for photography, as in many cases people do. They only fed him cow's milk, which is, is extremely toxic. So as a result of that, his digestive system never developed. So um, Lori, our director, bottle fed him every couple of hours, uh, goat's milk and tried to get his system to develop. Um, gradually, he got better and we were able to feed him ground beef, ground pork and ground chicken. We introduced boneless chicken to him at one point so he could get the feeling of having a hunk of meat. And gradually, as, as he got better, 
uh, we were able to introduce chicken with bones and different types of poultry, turkey. Now, obviously, he's a smaller size, and they did that on purpose. Well, he, they tried. He's a pretty big. He's a Is pretty he? big tiger. Yeah. But he's kind of all cuddled he's up all there. He's all curled so, up right now. So we can't really see that full physique. Now, how old is he now? So Onyx is 15. Okay, so he still has a lot of life left into him. Now, uh, that he's getting a better diet, are you seeing activity rather normal, or are we still seeing some restrictive activity? No, he, he does act pretty normal. He's not real, real active, um, but he's comfortable. We do have to uh, put mineral water in his, mineral oil, I'm sorry, in his water so that he, it helps aid in his digestion and, and aids in him um, eliminating. But uh, on, on a whole, I would say he's doing really, really well. And leading a very normal, at this point, and happy life. Absolutely. And certainly extremely relaxed. Extremely <laughs> relaxed, yes. For the rest of his life, Onyx will need to be on a special diet adapted just for him. Right after the break, we're back at the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary to learn how we can help a bird in distress, one caught up in fishing line. In Florida, pelicans can be found anywhere people are fishing. Hanging out along a fishing pier to sitting in the water and just watching you fish off your boat. What they're waiting for is an easy meal, but this is what gets them into a lot of trouble. Pelicans being hooked is one of the most common bird health issues staff at the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary have to deal with. This is awful. Yes, to just is. even look at, mm -hmm. let alone understand how it even got here. Could mm -hmm. you tell us? So this is all fishing line and hooks that we have removed from birds that have been admitted here. Um, this is all within the last three to four months. So this is the most common thing that we see and it's really irresponsible fishing fishermen. So they throw this on the ground, they don't properly dispose of it. Um, they'll accidentally hook a bird and they'll just cut the line and that leaves that hanging on that bird until unfortunately we find them. So it's, it's a lot of just human error and human apathy to mm -hmm. getting to properly disposing of this. Now, when you look at a hook like this, I mean, this, <laughs> this is unbelievable. I yep. mean, <laughs> even to my touch. And to find out that these poor birds are, are swallowing this. Mm -hmm. And there is an x-ray right behind me mm -hmm. of one of your patients where it clearly shows that there is a hook just like this mm -hmm. embedded in probably the abdominal area yes. of, the, of that bird. Mm -hmm. So when you find something like this, um, after you take that deep breath, how do we get this out? 
So of a it, word. it really depends on where it is. So if you do have hooks that are internal, usually that requires surgery. Depending on where it is, we would need a radiograph to determine where in the stomach it is. Uh, birds actually have a proventriculus and a ventriculus, so it's two separate stomachs. Um, and so that really also complicates depending on where the hook is located. If it's something external, we often can do it here. And it's also something very simple that we can actually teach the public so that instead of cutting that line, you can actually remove that hook and let that bird go free without the hooks in them. He's actually one of our patients right now. Ooh, I'm gonna take him out so it's easier to see. <laughs> Right, so this is one of our patients that we're actually currently treating for a hook injury. You can see he's holding that leg up. He had an embedded hook in the thigh there that was removed by our uh, veterinarian, Dr. Zellner. Um, but if you, are, if you do happen to hook a pelican, uh, all we ask is you gently reel that bird in and then very nice. If you have a towel, a shirt, really anything, you're gonna wanna drape it over the head and then you can get the body under your arm. And the important thing with pelicans is that they actually are obligate breathers or mouth breathers. So they need to have their mouth held open so that they can breathe. So you'll see I'm holding both, both his upper and lower beak open. And this is how you would properly restrain a pelican. And then from here, um, you. You know, you'd either, if you feel confident taking the hook out yourself, you can do that, or you'd wait for assistance from a rehabilitator. So um, I'm going to demonstrate how to remove a hook from a bird. So you see this hook here. If you look closely, you see that the hook has a barb at the end. So you don't want to pull it out with the barb still intact, because that could cause further damage to the bird. So let's say this is a bird here. You just take the hook and you'll actually want to push that through so that you can see the barb. And then you'll need cutters and you'll want to cut that barb off. And so now you can safely pull the rest of that hook out and you have effectively unhooked a bird and they can go on their way. <laughs> This is, you know, 90% of the injuries that we see for pelicans, cormorants, laughing gulls, terns, great blue herons, things like that. It's the most common injury that we see. Remember, if you're fishing and you end up hooking a bird, don't cut the line. For more information how to safely remove a hook, visit the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's website at myfwc.com. You can find it under the Education tab. Stay with us. There's more animal outtakes coming up.
So now we have this adorable creature who I do know is a permanent resident here. Mm -hmm. He has a name. Yes, his name is Rufus and he is an Eastern Screech Owl. And he came here at the beginning of 2016 after likely being hit by a car. So when he first came in, he was blind in both eyes. Um, he also had severe auricular or ear trauma and head trauma as well. Uh, since then, he has regained vision in the left eye, but he is still blind in the right eye. And he's, but he's doing very, very he's well. He's doing very well, very yes. Very well, <laughs> yes, and he's. Oh, you're winking at me and I'm loving that, yes. What is the life expectancy of Rufus? So uh, they can usually live into the early teens in the wild. For him, I'd expect him to get closer to 15 to 16 years old. So he's got a long life yes. to go here. Yes, and we guess that he is about three years of age. So he's got, he's got some time with us left, <laughs> which Absolutely. we're very thankful for. <laughs> yes, he is adorable. And look at all of this beautiful plumage here, like somebody took a paintbrush and just kind of speckled him up just a little bit. Yeah. And you know, for what happened to him, whatever it was, because of the wonderful, compassionate care you have given him, he's not stressed. No. As a matter of fact, a general observation is that none of these birds here are stressed, and yet they came in in the worst possible condition that they could. Mm -hmm. So. What would do you attest that to? Is it the compassionate care that you give, the loving care, they feel secure? What is it? I would hope it's that, because we, you know, their, their quality of life is our utmost importance. So anything to improve their quality of life, anything to enrich their lives is really our main focus. So we spend a lot of time ensuring that they live a great life here, that they do feel safe. They're very, very well fed. And so I hope that that is why they feel that way. <laughs> you have a beautiful sign as you enter the facility and it's the definition of a sanctuary. You take care of life and life is always respected yes. in a sanctuary. Rufus, you are definitely respected. We're so happy to welcome Dr. Alan Glassman to Animal Outtakes. He is one of our medical staff at Dante's Den, and you're going to teach us about something, are you not? <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope. Uh, we're going to talk a little about uh, x-rays, of course, uh, the technical name radiographs that your pet may get at the vet. And um, the old-fashioned, and still people do use it, I shouldn't say that, the, the x-ray films that get slapped up on the view box was the way that most all of us took x-rays. Now it's mostly digitized on computers. So <clears throat> most vets now have it on a, a system where you'll bring it up on the computer screen. Okay, so now Dr. Glassman, you've pulled up an x-ray that has a mysterious <laughs> <laughs> foreign body into it. Right, it's so a little hard to tell what this is, but it is quite a bit. Uh, we're gonna talk about some normal things you might find inside a body and some abnormal things. And this is totally normal. This is for puppies. Ah! And they're, it's hard to see because they're all kind of overlapping each One. other. You can see the head very clearly uh -huh. there and a couple other heads over here. Two. And I think three, there's a four. fourth one there. Yeah. yeah. So that's what puppies look like. And these are pretty well developed. They're probably ready to be born. Okay. Well, here we're looking at an x ray. I can tell you, it's a fish hook and it just makes me cringe. Yeah, it's amazing the things that mostly dogs, cats certainly eat things too, but dogs tend to be more adept at it and it's a big fish hook and it's probably mostly in the stomach and a little bit in the esophagus. The uh, the long part, straight part, is probably still on the way to the stomach. Now, as they swallow it, isn't it piercing on the way down? It's amazing how far sharp objects get. It's ama you know, they, yeah, sure, things perforate, things puncture, but it's amazing how far they can go sometimes without causing damage till they get stuck. Now, this would have to be surgically Right. This pet removed. would probably have abdominal surgery. The surgeon would go into the stomach and hopefully pull it out pretty easy, hopefully without right the point tearing or mm -hmm. piercing something. And then hopefully would never do this again. So now we have another one, Dr. Glassman, and this this is this is a knife. This is a chisel. This is something. Right. It's evidently a bread knife and it's huge. It goes from 
the, probably the bottom of the esophagus all the way into the stomach. It's a huge knife. And we're not even seeing the wood handle on it, too. How? How do they do this? I don't know. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and you think, it certainly can't taste good, but <laughs> they no, do this no, kind no. of... So uh, let's talk about that, though. They, they see this knife, oh, this is something I want. What are they doing, actually inhaling? And is the saliva pushing it down? They're certainly not chewing this. Yeah, uh, no, it's just swallowed. I imagine they pick it up because oh, it's something interesting new. Let's taste this. Let's see what it is. And they put it in their mouth and start to swallow it. And it's amazing that, that something like that can go down. And without harming the esophagus. Oh, this, or any this other... esophagus could be lacerated. It I could have no... be. Oh, sure. Okay. Absolutely. So then again, another surgery. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and this is when the parents, such as me, would be out on the floor, panicked. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here we have one. I know what this is, Dr. Glassman. Mothballs. <laughs> Try pool table balls. No, 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 no. Yep, eight That's... of them. How? How? Why? How? Well, well why is <laughs> how I know, sort of. <laughs> why is another question. <laughs> And again, this is lodged in the uh, This abdominal? is all in the stomach. Yeah, you can see yeah. the spine here. And actually, yeah, they went, they made it all the way to the stomach. The, you can see the, the black, the air around in the stomach. And uh, yeah, the abdomen is this way. I can't imagine because these things mm -hmm. don't have any taste. I mean, what are they, what is the joy of this? <laughs> you gotta <laughs> ask the dog. <laughs> this costs money, right? Oh, of course. For the owner. Yeah. What are we talking about, roughly, for this type of surgery? Well, again, it varies from hospital to hospital, doctor to doctor, area to area, you know, city to city, of course. But I would say minimum exploratory surgery. You got to go in. You got to open the stomach. You got to close the stomach. You got to make sure everything's clean. It's it's a big process. Absolute minimum, I would think of a thousand dollars up to maybe about three thousand dollars. You get it out, whatever it is. How do you prevent this again? Well, that's very hard. I took earplugs twice out of a cat until the owner finally realized I better not leave my earplugs on the uh, bed table anymore. Um, but yeah, some pets have to be restricted either to one room of the house if you're away or working, whatever, or crated like dogs. A lot of dogs are crate, traded, uh, crate trained and stay in their crate during the day and just physically keep them away from things like little children. You just have to physically keep them out of their own harm's way. So we need to animal proof. Right. Animal proof, uh, like you would child proof homes? a house yes. for a baby, right? Yes. You got it. And not assume that they're going to walk past something. Oh, no, it's just like a, having a baby. They're going to get into everything. We hope you had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. Zeus and I will be back here again next week with even more animals and some wild adventures. Until then, thanks for watching. They evolved from dinosaurs and can be found just about everywhere on Earth. From I was going to say desserts. <laughs> <laughs> you can see where my mind is. Okay. <laughs>